Welcome to another episode of Southern Ohio Matters with Gina Collinsworth. Gina is going to be talking with special guests about tourism, so stay tuned. Welcome to another episode of Southern Ohio Matters with Gina Collinsworth. Gina Collinsworth is a public information coordinator with the Ohio Valley Regional Development Commission in Waverly, Ohio. Gina, it's always a pleasure talking with you. You bring so many great guests talking about neat, nifty things that are happening, uh, not only in Ohio, but Southern Ohio especially. Thank you, Patrick. It's always a pleasure to be with you, and I enjoy talking with you about things because there's a lot of great things happening in the region, so we want to make sure that we're shining a spotlight on those, and people will understand better how can they get involved. One one of the uh, guests that you have, I guess, is very actively involved in the tourism. Well, it's exciting to know that Ohio Valley Regional Development Commission is part of the planning for the region. We we serve 12 counties in southern Ohio, so all the way from Claremont County near Cincinnati, up the river, all the way over to Gallia County, and then north as far as Ross County. So we are really thrilled to have some dollars coming into the region that are dedicated to uh, research, and one of the research projects we're working on is tourism. So I brought for my first guest today, someone in our office who is directly connected to the project and doing a lot of great work. Jessica Keaton is with us this morning. Hi, Jessica. Hi, Gina. Hi, Pat. Today's show is pretty fun and something near and dear to your heart and my heart, and it's about tourism, how we can grow tourism in the region and make that one of the big drivers for economic activity and community development, as well as jobs. So Jessica, let's talk about tourism and tell us a little bit about the tourism study that OVRDC has been working with, uh, Place Dynamics. And of course that's funded by EDA. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so we were really fortunate through the CARES Act. Um, Congress sent the EDDs uh, some non-competitive dollars uh, to do some studies on recovery and resilience in the regions that we serve. And when I I spoke with our executive director, John Hemmings, about this money, I said, you know, this is a really great opportunity for us to, you know, take that and do some planning work with it that would be really meaningful because we had been working um, towards some sort of planning project for tourism prior to this and prior to the pandemic, but um, we hadn't been able to secure funding for that. So it was it was really exciting to get these dollars and John of course approved that. So we moved forward, put out our RFP, hired Place Dynamics, and they're doing some really exciting work in the region, following, you know, patterns of travelers in and out of our region. So they're they're looking at tourists and you know local visitors to our tourism assets, um, you know, pairing up where are people going when they might visit one asset or another and you know what are the most popular assets in our region among other things so it's it's a really really exciting thing uh, to be a part of it really has been eye-opening and enlightening because you know we are definitely living in a rural area southern ohio is definitely wilderness and frontier related and you know a lot of great resources for natural experiences and a lot of tourism in that way. But it was it was really surprising to me to learn that from out of the region, which is de- uh, designated as like a outside of the 50 mile radius, we had 2.8 million visitors last year. That was one of the early findings in the study, which is not finished. I wanna make sure everyone understands we're about halfway with that. And uh, I was shocked to hear that number. Was that a surprise to you? Not really uh, for me personally, because um, we have a lot of world-class natural and cultural assets in our region. We are home uh, to uh, the largest jungle gym store, which is a huge draw. Uh, We're home to actually the bulk of ODNR's bridal trails, for instance. We have Wayne National Forest. We have the state's largest state forest in Shawnee State Forest, uh, numerous wonderful parks, and of 
course, you know, Native American sites with worldwide significance. Um, so, you know, to see how many visitors that we're getting, I really wasn't surprised, but I am excited because to see that many and see that that is our baseline where we can grow from is incredibly exciting. Many people from northern parts of Ohio, once they come down here, it, it seems like they make a, a, a yearly trip. Yeah, and this is one of the challenges that we've spoken to our consultant about. When people think Ohio, they think flat, they think cornfields. If they're not from Ohio or from this region, they don't even understand. I mean, some Ohioans even themselves don't even know what we have down here that, you know, our, our topography and our geology is different. You know, the North Country Trail and the Buckeye Trail that run through here are adjacent to Hawking Hills, things like that. Um and I think the word is starting to get out. So Jessica, what will be the next steps on this research project? Um, we're halfway through. Once Place Dynamics has all of the information and the data, then what happens? So something that we recently did is um, we had a tourism stakeholders meeting up at the Adena Mansion and Gardens. And Place Dynamics was able to take input from a lot of our stakeholders. We had a really... Uh, good turnout for that. We have people from state government, um, local governments. We had people who were representing tourism assets and businesses in our region. And uh, they, you know, gave their thoughts on what they think our strengths and weaknesses are. So Place Dynamics will take that information and be able to devise a strategic plan. And I think one of the directions that we're really moving into is uh, maybe supporting entrepreneurs in some meaningful way so that the residents in our region can really capture those dollars and maximize, you know, the potential there uh, to really, you know, kind of replace some jobs that were lost by the coal industry, uh, of course, assist in recovery and resilience from the COVID-19 pandemic, and just overall strengthen our communities where we've, you know, really suffered, you know, generational poverty, and other obstacles. So what a great opportunity for Appalachians to, to take and really better themselves. Absolutely. I know in the meeting, uh, we just had this meeting that you were talking about with our stakeholders, and I really enjoyed hearing from all the different people that attended about what was special about their county. And it was great to see uh, the list that you generated of assets, but also some of the negatives. So if you could remember a few from yesterday when we had the meeting, what were some of the things that people at the meeting thought were some of the challenges for the area that are keeping us from developing more in that tourism ecosystem? I think there were a couple big takeaways and you know themes that we heard repeated uh, throughout the meeting, and those included, you know, a lack of available funding uh, for the, uh, you know, infrastructure or entrepreneurial development, uh, other things, broadband's a big issue, um, which actually OVRDC is, is working on right now to, to try to help remedy that, because we understand in many arenas, broadband is an issue, not only due to the pandemic, but just as, you know, being citizens of you know, this century. <laughs> yes. But um, and another thing was, you know, people say they don't have enough staff, so they lack the capacity to actually uh, put their plans into motion. So that's a big barrier. And I, I think, you know, another big one that we heard over and over, uh, Gina, was that we really need to flip the narrative on Appalachia because, and, and not only for, you know, outsiders who, you know, may see in the national news media or the state news media all the negative things about our region. Um, so, of course, we need to change their minds. But, you know, we kind of have a self-image problem. So we need to change the hearts and minds of people who are, are here uh, to let them know, you know, we are worthy. And this is a fantastic place. And you can grow here and have a great living, um, you know, just personally and professionally. Absolutely. Quality of life. I think more and more people are starting to question that. And I think the COVID epidemic had an impact to make people wonder, you know, am I really truly in the job I love to do and feel like I'm contributing? And, you know, where do I really want to live? And we live here. So we're saying, come, come live with us. 
Um, one thing I really liked yesterday that I saw happening was a lot of collaboration and networking and people were sharing ideas. And I think that's also a really great strategy we need to emphasize. And I wondered if you would share a little bit of a case study around the people working in Ripley, Ohio and Adams County on some of the stops that they're working to develop in their area. You know, they have some really great underground railroad type uh, historic places to visit the Rankin House. And I know you've been working with that group. Tell us a little bit about their case study. So Ripley is a wonderful community, really picturesque, small village on the Ohio River. And like Gina said, it's chock full of history and just natural beauty. So um, actually, it was three years ago. It was the end of October 2018. Um, the uh, people who represented Ripley at the time invited me down uh, for a meeting to talk about, you know, what can we do to grow tourism? And they were really interested in constructing a boat dock because we have river cruises that go up and down, you know, the river out of Cincinnati and up towards Marietta. And they said, you know, we used to do this, but then, you know, we lost the ability to host these boats and we want to pick it up again. So, you know, we can grow and we can funnel visitors up to these fantastic sites here. So at that time, I said, you know, unfortunately, I don't, you know, really have a lot of resources for you. And I kind of walked away from that meeting feeling really negative about things. And, but but then the tide really started to change. Um, and we saw a lot of our federal partners really beginning to see the tie between economic development and tourism and that there really is a real opportunity here for us to assist our communities in this manner. Uh, they got a hold of us and Brenda Haas with GOA and GOA is a fantastic partner. And I don't governor's think, office of Appalachia. Yes, governor's <laughs> office of Appalachia. I don't think that we would be anywhere without them. Yeah. They're so uh, they assisted Ripley in applying for a power grant um, to help construct a new boat dock that they're calling Freedom Landing, since there's a significant site on the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. um, so they are moving into that. It hasn't been approved yet, um, but uh, we've been told it's a pretty competitive project. So we moved forward to help them get an access road grant, and that is in the works uh, to construct a road down to this. And it's just a really great story of a lot of partners working together and not giving up. And I think that, you know, that is the real takeaway from this, the collaboration and determination that the village has had. Absolutely. They are, you know, they're doing big things and they're going to be really successful, I think. I like that also that that project highlights the three year timeline. You know, it doesn't move fast, but it does yeah. move. Right. Yeah. Yeah. As long as you don't quit. <laughs> You know, you Don't never know up. what's going to happen, uh, yes. you know, as far as these funding sources go. So if you have a plan, you can put something into motion. But, you know, without a plan, where are you going to go? We're excited about this plan and this research that we will have in probably, do you think the middle of next year we'll be able to put it out? Or when will the study and, and all the data collection be finished? Yeah, so this meeting marked the halfway point Uh for these activities. Um, so June of next year, uh, we should be uh, at or near the point of being able to release that, that full strategy and all the information. Once again, I wanna remind everyone that Jessica helps with economic development. She's the coordinator for economic development in the office. So EDA currently has funding for related tourism projects as well as ARC, Appalachian Regional Commission, and the Power Grant Program, which is to assist coal communities with transitioning their economy. And tourism is a great option. So Jessica, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your information and for what you do every day, day in and day out, which is assist communities in the region and help people. And you do a great job. Thank you. And thanks for having me, Gina. And you're definitely a part of that effort. We're a team, great team yes, here at OVRDC. So one of the things the governor's office of Appalachia has mentioned is, and what Jessica mentioned, flipping the narrative. You know, Appalachia, for some people who may have never visited, I'm sure that what they have heard or read about is nothing like 
what it is here. <laughs> so, you know, that's something you really have to think about, though, especially for tourism, is how do you educate people about the beauty of the region and the availability of sites and, and events? And, and the people. And, the, and people. the people, yes. So our next guest is another great person that's related to tourism, and we're going to speak with her next. I'm so excited, Patrick, for all of our viewers to meet Amope Carter de Boiku. Amope is here today, and she is an actor, a storyteller, and a writer, and we met at the Tourism Summit meeting that we had recently, and I wanted her to come on the show and share some of her story, and it's great to have you here today, Amope. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gina. Thank you for helping another dream come true. I appreciate it. Yes. I'm so excited by your project and the plans that you have, and I want everyone to meet you. So tell us a little bit about yourself and mm -hmm. tell us about how your work relates to tourism in our region. Okay. Well, I grew up in Ironton, and just to prove that I'm a real Irontonian, I know that it's correctly pronounced Arnton. <laughs> That's right. And I know the state that it's in is Ohio. <laughs> so, <Yeah>. Ohio. <laughs> but I, I grew up there. I graduated from Ironton High in 1970. I had I am the oldest of four siblings, two of which are Ironton High grads, two of which are South Point grads. So, you know, we 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 rock both colors at our house. We had to learn how to cheer for South Point. That was a little hard, but we managed to do that. I am from the Carter family. My father is the Reverend Douglas D.C. Carter, um, and he is the second oldest of a slew of 12. So I write, when I write, I often refer to my seeing eye family. And somebody asked me, oh, was somebody in your family blind? I said, no, there were just so many of them that everywhere I went, somebody could see what I did. That's why I <laughs> called them my seeing eye family. But I started storytelling in 1990 as a way to adjust some marital issues. Um, I had my children late in life. So there I was at 38 and 41 with newborns, two kids under the age of five and one income. And years ago, as a child, I had been encouraged to do speeches at church. I was a, a narrator for a Christmas play in kindergarten. I had done some work at, at the university level high school plays, university pageants, you know, just placeholders. But everywhere I went, people said, you have the most unique voice. Um, you should do something with that voice. So, but at that time, you know, teachers, teaching was a primary uh, occupation for women, nursing and being a clerk. And which insisted, you know, so my mother insisted that I have fine handwriting and an expansive vocabulary. That's what made me a writer, that and the Bobsy Twins and Nancy Drew and all the other things that I was reading, Happy Hollisters. So the library became my refuge, and I was a voracious reader. Uh, my parents invested in an encyclopedia, and for our new generation, that's like getting your own special internet account. You know, having your own set of encyclopedias in your house um, was a sign of... Uh, economic and intellectual status. Uh, some people would have said it made you uppity and hinkty, but hey, it made me a scholar, right? So, so you started in Lawrence County in Ironton, and right. now you live where? Dayton? I'm in oh, Dayton, right. but in between I spent 30 very, very um, productive years in Cincinnati, mm -hmm. and then I, I did time in Cleveland. I did three years in Cleveland in that get up in the dark, come home in the dark, snow from Halloween to St. Patrick's Day <laughs> yes. and decided then I didn't need to live north of I-70. That's not my landscape. I prefer hills and valleys as opposed to sheer lines, lakefront wind. <laughs> yes. The beauty down here. We were just speaking with Jessica Keaton, who I know that you had met through our office as well yes. and the tourism project. And we were talking about the beauty of the area. I mean, our region is so gorgeous. So I'm interested, what are some of the challenges in your opinion? I know you're very interested in tourism as far as connecting the landscape to some of the, the historic significance. So tell us a little more about that. What do you feel are some of the challenges in the region to making tourism a big echo, you know, an economic driver? 
the first thing that I noticed as a child, well, teenager, was when the uh, federal and state money came available during the 30s to the 60s with the urban renewal programs that wound up redlining housing. Well, Ironton was too small to redline. We already knew where the red line was, but we had a mixed community. So the housing issue didn't bother us. It was the transportation issue because they moved 52 out of the river plain up on top of that sandstone hill that we used to play on as kids. And so the first impact for us was nobody driving through to get ice cream or gasoline or a newspaper. Mm -hmm. And so it became a straight shot from Chicago to Myrtle Beach. And we felt the impact of that in the 60s. The, and that's one of the things that pushed people in my generation out because the downtown area be began to just wither on the vine. So that out migration, once I left looking for culture, realizing what I had as culture and realizing the value of the experiences on that landscape. And I began to write and reflect about that. And when I was in the fourth grade, we took Ohio history and everybody in the state had to learn about the significance of the Hanging Rock Iron District. And with Huntington being the second largest inland port authority, you know that that uh, sometimes you got to look backwards it's called Sankofi. You got to look backwards to see where to go forward. Right. You got to take the things that you have. So hospitality, we're not as unfriendly as people would like to think that we might be. We get right. bad press. We've got great landscape. We got a variety of things. You can hike hills, you can ski, you can run the rapids, you can just go to some flat land and walk and look at prairie land. Uh, you can go to old man caves and get lost in those old ancient river valleys. There's great food, there's great music. Um, and of course, when you get to know us, we're great people. Absolutely. It's exciting. I, I think we have such a great wealth of cultural assets, but like you mentioned, the people, the people make the difference and our people yes. are amazing. And you know, where, where we're from, we understand that relationships is what makes things work. So one of my goals here is to bring that third generation that came out of Appalachia looking for industrial, the stability of industrial wages in places like Dayton, bringing them back to a place that they may fantasize about or might have misgivings about to show them the diversity of Appalachia as a region, its people and its landscape, and to be able to shine our own lamp as a destination place that you don't always have to drop down thousands of dollars to have an enjoyable, a relatable, informative, educational experience. You can come to Southern Ohio and you can get some of everything. That sounds so good. And I know you've been planning a special project with Sinclair College, and that's going to happen in the spring. Tell us more about that. That's going to be in March of 2022. Their College of Lifelong Learning has an Appalachian Studies class. And the uh, coordinator's name is Nora Stanger. Nora's from out the county, as we say, back behind Heckley or Heckla. And so she and I have struck up this relationship and we're going to take at least 20 students from here in Dayton. We're going to go over 35, talk about uh, the economy, the landscape, the abolition movement, the uh, resiliency of the people as they fought as freedom seekers and helped others. Then understanding the 19th century industrial patterns um, of Appalachia as America's first frontier and the unique situation of the tri-state there in Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia, and college visits and being able to see Marshall and OU Southern as potential transfer schools. And of course, showing them the way to get back to the region so that they can come on their own and bring their own families. Wonderful. Well, I, I'm so excited about that. And I'm really excited that you and I have connected and Jessica as well. And we're going to be friends, I can tell. I know we yeah. all have the same heart for the region. We just and, and we're going to have some public presentations while we're there, both at Marshall and at OU Southern. We'll make sure that we get the publicity out so that the community will be welcome to come. We'll have you back and we'll talk more about it when you're Thanks. in the 
Yeah. And Thank then we'll so plan a storytelling the- festival and we'll get everybody to come to Southern Ohio. <laughs> hey, I love that idea. That would be uh, great. It's been great talking to you all. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Amopi, Carter DeBoyku. And that's it for the show today, Patrick. We've had a great show about tourism and talking about the beauty in our area. We love Appalachia, Ohio. 